is defined as this limit of the Riemann sums. So this is the definition of the definite integral. And if I ask you to evaluate a definite integral using the definition. I expect you to go through this limit and summation process. And in order to do that, you do need to know delta x yeah. and x of i. And we've seen those before. That's what we worked on last week, right? Was, was doing that, um, evaluating those, and there's some, there's some work there. We also evaluated this expression we can use geometry to evaluate that expression as well. And that means if we have some knowledge of areas, we can use the idea of sort of positive or negative area to compute that definite integral. So if it says use geometry, that's what we did in the group work on Wednesday, right? We looked at these you know, rectangles or triangles and used that to evaluate what the, the value of that definite integral was. What we are going to work on today is something called the fundamental theorem of calculus. Or the FTC. And it's got an impressive sounding name, right? And it, it is uh, kind of a big deal. And what it says is really what we discovered in that group work on Wednesday, um, which was there's a relationship between this accumulation or area function. 
So what you guys did in the group work is you found these area functions. They were like capital A, capital B, capital C. Those were area functions that were describing how much area we were getting under these curves. The, the discovery, or sort of the point, was that if you take the derivative of those, you get back the original function. So that this idea of an area function is related somehow to derivatives and antiderivatives. And that's really what the fundamental theorem of calculus is, is stating that relationship carefully. Um, there's two parts to the fundamental theorem of calculus. Part one is, is kind of the, the big part. It's got all the, the important details in it. Um, and it's, but what's really nice is it's a very simple theorem to state. It says, if f um, of t is continuous on a closed interval, That's all we need is a continuous function. And g of x is the integral from a to x of f of t dt. So this is our definite integral. This is either the limit of sums or geometry, right? That's what this is, this is telling you. This is the area from a to x. This g of x is like our capital A of x, capital B of x from that group work, right? It is an area function that's accumulating area up to x. So given this definition, then g of x is continuous, differentiable, and g prime of x equals f of x. So this is the statement of the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. And the, the big statement really is this last line, right? That if you have a continuous function, if you look at the area function, the derivative of the area function is the original function. And, and that's what we saw on, um, on Wednesday. If, if the derivative is a function, then the derivative is certainly, then the original function is continuous and differentiable, right? Because its derivative exists. So this stuff sort of comes from the fact of, of this, right? If you know this statement, then you know it's continuous and differentiable as well. And I, I think, you know, we saw a couple cases where that seemed to work out on Wednesday, but in no means is that a proof, right? Maybe that just worked out for nice, like, uh, linear functions. Who knows if that's going to work for other functions. So what we want to do today is actually do this proof. We want to prove that this really is true. And it's not a... a and an exceptionally difficult proof. We've done a lot of the groundwork already. Um, just like many of our other proofs, uh, we're, I'm not going to ask you to replicate this proof in any way, but I think it, it, it brings up a lot of important issues. And hopefully, you'll get some sense of why this might be true, even if we wouldn't be able to reproduce that proof on our own, necessarily. So, Let's let f of t be continuous and g of x equal this function e of x dt. dt. So we're just those are our assumptions. So let those things be true. We want to find the derivative of g. And um, remember, 
remember what is the derivative, what is the definition of the derivative of a function? It's as the limit. The limit h approaches 0 our function of x plus h minus our function. So this is, this is what we're trying to find, right? This is what the derivative is. So I need to evaluate this limit. I'm going to sort of build my way there. Um, let's look at g of x plus h minus g of x. So by our definition, that is the definite integral from a to x plus h minus the integral from a to x. Right? I mean, that's what g is. It's the area up to some certain point. And if you remember one of our properties of integrals, if I look at the area from a to x plus h, and I subtract the area from a to x, and again, remember, this might be positive or negative values, actually, right? But if I, if I look at the difference of those two things, what's left over? h. Or the difference between. Yeah, I mean, thinking of it geometrically, right, if this is a, and this is x, and this is x plus h, yeah, if I go from a to x plus h minus a to x, I, I should have left over this little chunk here. So this difference is equal to the integral from x to x plus h of f of t dt. So let's take a look at what that might look like. We're going to just assume f of t is positive just to help us um, visualize what's happening here. What I want to do is I want to get some, some sort of bound on what this definite integral might be. Like how big could this be and how small could this be based on the function? And the way I'm going to bound it is I'm going to remember that um, since f of t is continuous, it's continuous all the way from a to b, so it's going to be continuous at this little spot kind of in the middle, right? We're imagining x and x plus h are somewhere in the middle. Since f of t is continuous, on the closed interval x to x plus h, remember if you have a function that is continuous on a closed interval, what can you tell me about the function? f of t has an absolute max and an absolute minimum somewhere. We don't know where exactly, but somewhere. f of t has an absolute max and min on the interval x to x plus h. That's the extreme value here. Let's let um, f of v equal capital M be the max, and f of u lowercase m would be the minimum. Right, we don't know where they are, but I know u and v are definitely inside of this interval, right? Because it has to have its max and min somewhere on the interval. And for our picture here, I can see that the maximum in this case is going to be this endpoint here. This is the max, and it looks like the minimum is right there. Well, what about the integral or the area can I bound the area 
based on the fact that the function has a maximum and a minimum, what's the very largest this area could be? The max times the width. The max, which would be my height there, times the width, and what's the width? H. H, right? The difference between x plus h and x is h. So the very largest that that <coughs> integral could be would be the maximum times h, right? I mean, you can see it visually, right? That's going to be a bigger rectangle than what the actual area is. And the minimum, in the same way, the minimum is here, and that provides a lower bound for my function. <coughs> and remember, m, m is a, a function value, so let's call that f of u. There's, there's notation here. It looks messy, but, but it's not any crazy ideas yet, right? We're just, that's just what the min was. It was some value of the function. Remember, this thing that I'm working with here, this definite integral, is really the g of x plus h minus g of x. I want to find the limit of that quotient. So what should I do to sort of get that closer to this? What can I do to this inequality? Squeeze theorem. It is effectively going to be some kind of squeeze theorem because I do want to take the limit. But before I take the limit, I want to divide by h, right? Do you see this, this numerator here is, is exactly the same as this. That's the g of x plus h minus g of x. Those are the same things. So what I really want to do is divide everything here by h. Um, I'm going to assume h is positive. You can repeat it when h is negative and get the same result. But I want to assume it's positive. That's important because when I divided by h, if I didn't know if it was positive or negative, I, that would mess up my inequality. Right? So we're going to assume it's positive. I'm going to divide everything here by h. So that's going to give me f of u. I'm going to write it out in front just so I don't have some complex fraction. So that's just dividing this by h. There, the h is canceled. Oops, sorry, h is canceled. See that? OK. So this middle piece is, is almost what I want. This middle piece is almost the derivative, right? In order to make it the derivative, I have to take the limit as h goes to 0. take the limit as h goes to 0. This is effectively a squeeze theorem. What happens to f of u, which is the minimum value of the function, as h goes to 0? You see, right, as, the, as h gets closer and closer to 0, the minimum value is going to get closer and closer and closer to f of x, right, the height there. As the interval goes to 0, both the minimum and the maximum values, because it's a continuous function, are going to have to go to the same spot, right? There's nowhere else for them to go. So this limit going towards f of x. What's happening to that limit, the maximum? It's also going towards f of x, right? As the interval shrinks down, both the minimum and maximum values have to be getting closer and closer and closer to f of x. Right? I mean, does that, that's a 
and you're sort of forced there because it's a continuous function. So both of those limits are f of x. What's that limit? That's f of x as well. And that's the squeeze theorem. And if you remember what that is, this part in the middle, that thing that's circled in green, is exactly this expression. That's the part in green, right? This is g of x plus h minus g of x divided by h. I just found that that limit is f of x. limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over h f of t dt equals f of x. And that is exactly what I wanted to prove. What I have shown, because the function f is continuous, <coughs> this exists for all x values between a and b. Therefore, the derivative of g exists, so g is differentiable, therefore it's also continuous, and the derivative of g is f of x. This is g prime. So as, as is often the case with proofs, it's, it's true, and we did it, and you actually, I think, really, if you follow along, there's no reason you couldn't have understood every single step. But then you get to the end sometimes, and you're like, well, okay, I guess, right? Like, it, it's sort of, everything links together, but it's hard to understand what that's really saying. What it's saying is that the area function, this thing, if this is f of t, if this is a, and this is x, <coughs> it's saying the rate of change at which we are gathering area. So that's what this accumulation or area function is doing, right? As x changes, it's gathering more area. The fundamental theorem of calculus says the rate at which we are gathering area, the derivative of g, is equal to the height of the function. And that makes <coughs> some sense if you think about if I add a little bit to this, the derivative is looking at what happens to the change in the function. Now, for the area function, the change in the function is this area, right? Like the slice right here. It's, it's asking <coughs> how much the area changes, change in y values, that's area, divided by change in x values. Right? And then what happens as, those, as that change goes to zero? As that change goes to zero, the amount that we're gathering, it turns out, is f of x. Right? The minimums and maximums are both going to f of x, so the, the ratios here is, is f of x. That's what the fundamental theorem is saying. So there's a, there's a proof, right, which doesn't involve any anything that's outside of our understanding. Right? All those things were stuff we've talked about. There's no new special things there. But then there's also this kind of vague idea of why it works. This is a this is a big idea. This is sort of a um, you know I don't want to oversell it, but it, it's it's like a touchstone of modern thought and discovery, right? Calculus, the discovery of calculus. It's an amazing a beautiful result, um, and I am, you know, you guys have an understanding of that, but it doesn't come right away. I mean, I'll tell you, I've taught this many years, and I still, you know, 
sometimes a habit. I can always do the proof, but sometimes I sort of, it makes sense to me, and then other times it sort of slips away, right? And I'm like, how, how does that all fit together? So it's something that will take time to kind of fully understand um, and appreciate, but it is it's a pretty great result. I think, um, you know, the reason you're not all ooing and eyeing is because you never really cared about this area function to start with, right? So the fact that it's derivative is something meh, right? Who cares? But um, part two uh, will show you the power of what we've just um, discovered. So I, I don't know, are there any questions about the, the proof or the steps here? It's deceptively simple what the result is telling you. But it relies on, um, you know, it took us all semester to kind of build ourselves up to this understanding. Um, before I get to part two, let me just see, let's show you a couple examples of how part one works. Um, let's let g of x equal the integral from a to x Um, well, let me make it from 2 to x of um, t cubed times the cosine of t dt. You can really, on one hand, you can think of the fundamental theorem part one as really being a new derivative rule. This is a new kind of function not like a trig function or a polynomial or an exponential function, right? It's this area function. Fundamental theorem of calculus really just tells us what the derivative of that area function is. And the derivative of this function? function of x. Yeah, it's, that's what the fundamental theorem says, is it says that the derivative of g of x is just the original inside function evaluated at x. Again, it's, it's deceptively simple. Like, oh, you just stick x in for the middle function, right? You could have told us that three months ago, right? And, and you could have sort of done this, right? But the idea there is, is much more sophisticated, right, than what's actually happening. Um, and there are some modifications on this that can make it more, more challenging. Let's try, um, let's go from two Um, square root of x. Now, we know the derivative of of this function from 2 to x, right? That's what we just did here. But now we're not going, we don't have the function evaluated at x anymore. We have the function evaluated at the square root of x. So what derivative rule do I need to calculate this derivative? It is uh, n rule for the x to the 1 half to the third. So it is a chain rule, right? Instead of evaluating the function at x, I know the derivative if this were x. But instead of being x, it's now the square root of x. So that's a chain rule, right? I'm evaluating it at a function of x rather than just x. So this is like my u. That's what we've called when we've done the chain rule. So I take my original derivative but I evaluate it at the function. 
So this is going to be the square root of x cubed times the cosine of the square root of x. That's my original derivative evaluated at u. And then I multiply by the derivative of that inside function, du. That's how the chain rule fits in with this fundamental theorem of confidence. So if your bounds are not a constant to x, then you're going to have to do some kind of modification, right? Then it's not. We don't know exactly what the derivative is. This fundamental theorem is telling me the derivative from a to x. I'm going to do it something different. I have to somehow modify it. And we do that all the time, right? You know the derivative of sine of x. It's cosine of x, right? But we can do all sorts of variations on that because we know those other rules. The chain rule, we don't use a lot of products or quotients here. Um, the chain rule is typically what we're doing. And the, the, the big thing to note is that I am not actually taking the derivative of t cubed times cosine of t, right? To do that, you'd use the product rule and, and other stuff. What the fundamental theorem is telling me is that this accumulation function is really the antiderivative. So imagine that this accumulation function is telling me the antiderivative, and then I take the derivative, I get kind of right back where I started. So I think mentally what you want to think about is that taking the derivative of this is, is neutralizing that. They're like inverse operations. Right? So if you have like a square root of something and you square it, you get rid of the square root, right? And what's underneath stays intact. It's the same idea here with derivatives <coughs> and this accumulation function. That's what the fundamental theorem is telling us. Is that really it's an antiderivative. So they, they neutralize each other, leaving me the original function. So think of the fundamental theorem of calculus as being a derivative rule. If you see this area function, and you're asked for its derivative, that's a fundamental theorem part one. That's what it's telling us. It's the derivative of that kind of function. Um, let me do a little bit of a trick question here. g of x equals the integral from um, 2 to 5 of t squared over the sine of t dt. the derivative here? Zero. zero. It is zero. Why? Because the it's not going from a constant to x. It's and not going from a constant to x. And then right? using the derivative of sine with the chain rule. So yeah, if you use the chain, so that's a, that is a good way of thinking about it. If you did this, if you imagine this 5 was my x and you tried to do it as a chain rule, you'd, you'd get you know something like this and you'd multiply by the derivative of 5, which would be zero. What's another, do you have another way of thinking about why it's zero? What, what is this thing? The rate of area. It's the, exactly, this is a function. This is the area from two to five. That's some number. It doesn't change. I don't know what the number is, but it's some number. It might be positive, it might be negative, who knows. But it's a constant. It's fixed. If I take the derivative of that, it's going to be 0. These are not fixed, right? As x changes, I'm getting different amounts of area. So that's a function. Right? That function, because it's changing, has a derivative. 
So it's important that we distinguish between these two types of expressions. This is a constant. This is called a definite integral. It's a number. We don't know what the number is all the time, but that's what we want to find. This is not a number. This is a function. Right? This is changing with respect to x. So they look similar. They're related to one another, but they're very different types of things. Okay. We'll do some more examples of these, but I, I do want to get to part two. Any any questions about even any of these examples? This is this is the hard one, I think, of what's going on here. It's hard to visualize what's happening, but uh, if you see it as a derivative rule, I think it, it should work with what we know about derivatives. Like you know the derivative from 2 to x, so it doesn't matter what the constant is, right? We saw that a little bit in the group work on Wednesday. It doesn't matter where you start the function, right? What matters is the change at the end of the function, right? Like started at negative 5 or 2, we're certainly going to be getting different numbers. But the derivative, how fast it's changing, only depends on x, the upper bound. Like, uh, you know, if this is my function and this is x, right, and I'm looking at this area function again, it doesn't matter where I started. One or minus one or whatever, how fast it's changing is only determined by what's happening here. Right? The actual value would be different. The area from two to x is different from the area from minus one to x. But the rate of change is all that's determined on f of x. Will the lower bound always be a constant on questions like this? Uh, no. How about this one? What if I go from the integral from x? to 3 of um, e to the t squared dt. That would be the negative of the derivative. So in this case, you can you can do it by flipping. So we, we again, you, you sort of don't know what this derivative is, but we can use one of the rules of derivatives. Or sorry, the rules of definite integrals to flip that around. And then I know what the derivative of that is. That's e to the x squared. Um, sometimes you'll see one where both the upper bound and the lower bound are both variables. In that case, you've got to split it apart into two integrals. So if it went from like x to x squared, I want to rewrite that as going you know, x, it doesn't actually matter what it is, x to 1 plus 1 to x squared. Then I can flip that one and evaluate both of those. Does that, that make sense? So you, you do have to, um, if it doesn't look like a to x, I got to I gotta get it to that point somehow. So we have to find a reason from a to, like, yeah. one game to form a to x? I want it to be from a to x, or at least a to some function of x. Right? If it's a to some function of x, then I can use the chain rule. Right? If it's a to x, I can just use it directly. So if it's not, you have to tweak it somehow. Those are, those are kind of the only two, I think, other modifications that you'll see. So 
before we had like f of t, we had kind of two variables. We had like the t that was the function and then the x that was the area function. Here we, we don't have a, an area function, so we can just keep everything with one variable. This is a definite integral. So this is a number. It turns out that if you know the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, you can show that this definite integral from, F, from A to B, and this is the limit of the Riemann sums. This is going to be very complicated to find, right? This is geometry. This involves all of these little rectangles, adding them all up, and then taking their limit as they go to infinity. It turns out you can evaluate that by taking capital F of B minus capital F of A, where capital F of X is any antiderivative of f of x. And, and this is the one where you should be, once you see this one, you'll be ooing and eyeing about this one. Because um, it really seems incredible that this could be true. This is a limit of sums. This is very complicated to evaluate. It involves adding up all of those rectangles, right, letting them go to infinity. And what this statement is saying is that rather than adding up all the rectangles and letting them go to infinity and seeing what that gives me, I can just take the antiderivative at the end point and minus the antiderivative at the starting point. It seems like there's no way that that difference could explain all of the things that might be happening to the function in between. But it turns out that that's really what the fundamental theorem of calculus is, is giving us, is this amazing tool for evaluating these definite integrals. Um, and we'll just go through a little proof. It's not particularly illuminating, but um, it does show it's true. We're going to let g of x equal our area function again. prime of x equal? F of x. F of x. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. Since the derivative of g is f, what do we call g? Capital F of x. Well, maybe. It's an antiderivative, right? So yes, g of x is an antiderivative. That's the definition of antiderivative, right? It's some function that when I take its derivative gives me f. So if capital F of x is any other antiderivative, g of x equals capital F of x plus c. Right? And we saw that, if you remember, when we did antiderivatives, that was one of our, our statements about antiderivatives, that if you have two antiderivatives, they have to basically be the same function except for a constant. So let's look at G of B minus 
Thomas G. of A. B minus F of A, I can just subtract the C here, I get G of B minus C minus G of A minus C. Like, like F of X is G of X minus C. I put the C over on the other side. Which is not a big deal because what happens to the C's? They, they cancel. Right, it's the same C in both cases. So these are going to cancel. I'm adding one and subtracting the other. Um, G of B, by definition, is the is the definite integral from A to B. interested in things like the integral from um, 1 to 3 of x squared dx. develop that limit definition. So you find delta x. We didn't call it a definite integral when we started. We just said it was the area, right? But those are the same things for a positive function like this. So I found the, the width of the interval, 2 over n. I found my x of i's. Plug those into the function. Use that summation tool. And then use the limit. And I found the value. What this fundamental theorem part two says is I can I can find exactly that same value if I can find an antiderivative of this function. This is a nice function, right? What's its antiderivative? Remember, antiderivative. Remember, antiderivative means you've got to tell me a function whose derivative is x squared. One, one third x cubed. So yeah, x cubed over 3 plus c. Now, notice the statement. I sort of erased it. But it said f of x is any other antiderivative. So you could choose x cubed over 3 plus pi or x cubed over 3 plus 
a hundred, but it'd certainly be nicest to choose x cubed over three plus. You can choose anything you want. I really like zero, right? I don't really want any number there if I can help it. And notice what happens, right, is whatever I pick is going to get both added and subtracted and go away anyway. So it actually doesn't matter what you pick, but you might as well pick zero, save yourself a little bit of writing, right? So if I can choose any antiderivative I want, I'm going to choose this one. Now I still have to evaluate it from zero to two. So this is the notation we use to write down what we're doing because it's kind of a two-step process. I have to find the antiderivative first, but then I have to plug in the endpoints. Right? So we use, we use this kind of vertical bar just to represent that I found the antiderivative. Now I'm going to plug in the endpoints. I always do the largest first the upper bound first minus the lower bound. Right, so that's my antiderivative evaluated at 2 minus my antiderivative evaluated at 0. And this gives me 8 thirds, which you may or may not remember, but that was the answer we got when we went through that whole definition, right, which took us a board and a half. And probably 20 minutes. Um, we did it immediately, and this was sort of our first run through this process. This is a great, great process. It only requires two things. It requires our function to be continuous, which is important. We have lots of functions that aren't continuous, and, and this isn't going to work if we're going over a discontinuity. So that's number one. Number two, we need to be able to find the antiderivative. And that's kind of our weak point right now. This one is fine, but there's lots of other functions out there that we don't know their antiderivatives yet. So in order for this method to be fully useful, we need to learn some more antiderivatives. And um, we'll do that a little bit at the end of chapter 5. Um, you'll do that a lot more when you get to Calc 2. Um, we need some strategies for antiderivatives to make this really work for us. Right? But if you can find the antiderivative, this is a really nice way of evaluating the definite integral, the area under the curve. I will still ask you to use the definition, but I will give you a very straightforward function. Right? Something, some polynomial, basically, is all we can use the definition for. Um, you're welcome to check your answer using the fundamental theorem but I want to see that you can do the limit and you can do the summation tools. Because um, without that, you don't really see what it's doing. Right? You don't understand the, the um, sort of amazing results. All right. Um, the definite integral from 1 to 3 of um, e to the x plus the square root of x dx. Let's go 1 to 4. Make our lives a little better. Is this fundamental theorem of calculus part 1 or part 2? <laughs> Two, how do you know that? It's no yeah, the, the, I think you guys all said the same sort of thing in different ways, right? It's it's one to four, there's no variables here, and it's not asking you for a derivative. The fundamental theorem part one is about derivatives. Fundamental theorem part two is about evaluating definite intervals. They are actually connected to each other, but they they look different in terms of the questions that are asked. So this is a fundamental theorem part two. What do you need to verify, first of all? The function needs to be continuous. Now, I will tell you that moving forward, um, 
you will be safe to assume that you are given continuous functions. So if you see a problem like this in the homework or a quiz or a test, you can assume it's continuous and charge ahead with the fundamental theorem. 99% um, of them are, and we don't want you sort of wasting your time in practice with checking each time. There will be questions that will ask you to understand that, but it will warn you somehow that you're checking for continuity. So it'll say something like, what's wrong with this problem? Or why does this, this definite interval not work? Right? And that will be your clue to think like, oh, well, maybe it's not continuous. Right? But in general, when you see a definite interval like this, we're going we're gonna to assume that it's continuous moving forward. But this one clearly is, right? No problems from one to four. So now all I need to do sometimes not in, inconsequential, right? But I need to find the antiderivative. This is where that work from um, 4.9 comes in, antiderivatives. Antiderivative of e to the x. And it's a sum, so I can just take these antiderivatives separately. This is x to the 1 half, so it's antiderivative is x to the 3 halves. Three halves. Three halves over 3 halves. I don't need a C because I'm doing a definite integral here. I get to choose the C to be 0. Once you do several of these, there's really only two spots that people will make an error. Um, it's a pretty straightforward process. People sometimes make errors with their antiderivatives. This happens, right? Some are harder than others. That's somewhere where you want to work and, and make sure that you get those correct. The second spot that people make errors is they will not evaluate the function properly. This one's always a little bit of a disappointment, right? Because you've done all the hard, high-level calculus work to get to this result. And then you plug in the numbers, and you get the wrong numbers, right? Um, you just have to take some time. It's not super fun, but you have to take some time to get your answer right, right? So. You put in 4 here, and then you subtract 1. I think like half the mistakes are probably from negatives, people forgetting to distribute or somehow messing up the distributing. Um, the other half is just sort of silly mistakes. That will be certainly frustrating online, right, when you do your work and feel like you have the right antiderivative and try to put in an answer and it tells you it's wrong. Um, just go back and sort of write out your calculations. Take your time. Be careful. <coughs> the square root of 4 is 2. 2 cubed is 8. Dividing by 3 halves is the same as multiplying by 2 thirds, so you get 16 thirds. Minus e, minus 2 thirds, gives me e to the fourth minus e plus 14 thirds. So that's the exact answer. Certainly a calculator can round that. Um, I will tell you, for me, when I'm grading these, um, what I look for, obviously, is getting to this point correctly. And then I do look to see that did you put the right values in. And then at that point, I'm just going to look from here to the right answer, right? And say, if you got the right answer, write full points. But if something's wrong, you know, you'll lose a, a small deduction, right? Like one point out of six or something. Like that. So, so, you know, I don't know how you always do these. It's, it's a pain to try and figure out where the little errors are, if they're just in the numbers. So just, just be careful. I won't give you really complicated ones to do um, on tests and quizzes. And again, the majority of it is getting to here, right? Like, if you get to here, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to get to the right answer. Um, but sometimes things get a little screwy. Now, this is also, I think, amazing because 
this is a really complicated function. Right? You don't even really know what this function looks like exactly. But I'm telling you that the area, it turns out this is a positive function from 1 to 4, the area under this curve is exactly equal to this number. That, that's actually amazing that we can find that and that we can find that sort of so quickly and elegantly, right? Um, it's not an approximation. It's exactly that value by using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Our definition, no way we could do the definition. We don't know how to work with summations. And it's pretty really <coughs> clear that that would be possible. Geometry, no way, right? We don't, these are curves. We don't know what their areas are. Fundamental theorem, no problem. Let's look at minus two to the cosine of x. Fundamental theory of calculus part one or part two? Part one. Part one is kind of giveaway, right? I mean, it's not hard to see if you look, right? It's just, they're different questions, right? But you got to look. This is part one because it's asking you about a derivative. What's the complication here? Yeah, that it's not to x, but it's to a function of x, cosine of x. It's not a big deal. It's just the chain rule. You guys are theoretically good at the chain rule. If you took the derivative from minus 2 to x, you'd get exactly this function at x. But you're not going to x. You're going to the cosine of x. So you take your normal derivative, and you evaluate it at the cosine of x. So this is going to look like the cosine of x squared plus 2 times the cosine of x. This is my g prime at u. And then I multiply that by the du, negative sine of x. There's no plus c's. I'm not taking antiderivatives, right? This is just a derivative rule. How do I find the derivative of this unusual function or new function? <coughs> That's the chain rule. This is my u. This is my d. F prime of u times d. You want to think about it as like a chain. That's how we would write it when we first were learning chain. focused on understanding area, the definition of the definite integral, and antiderivatives, so like uh, 4.9, 5.1, and 5.2. So, so, so tomorrow, or academic tomorrow. Oh, Are we, two days. Is there going to be any of the Newton's method? So I, let's, let's, um, let's not do Newton's method. We'll show up on the test, but I, I Right. So let's focus instead on antiderivatives and then your area of the problem. So you should understand the kind of definition of the definite integral. You should understand how to do um, definite integrals by the, the definition and by geometry. 
you want to check your answer using this result, you can, but I'm not going to test you on this um, yet. it as the definite integral, where 5.1 we just talked about it as area, but we know that you know, it's really the same thing. So, um, um, and then we have our, our you know, a little bit of a shorter section, our test is a little ways away, but um, the fifth, um, so what is that, a week from Wednesday? Um, so on Wednesday I'll you know, post another review section. Um, it's really over chapter 5, and including then this 4.9 and, and the Newton's method. Um, but the, the big ideas are really kind of right now, and then we have two more sections in chapter 5 that we're going to cover, by 4 and by 5, five. Um, some more ways of finding antiderivatives um, and some tools, some more applications of what this actually does for us. And so that's, that's sort of our schedule. So just to warn you, it's, it's a little bit of a shorter section, right? I think during the have almost a month, this is more like two and a half weeks or something like that. Any questions on that? For whatever reason, I don't know why, it's something in the way I teach it, or it's just, just natural because the idea is the, the fundamental theorem of calculus part one is, is sort of typically less <laughs> believable than the fundamental theorem part two. I think part of it is you, you have a better sense of what a definite integral is, right? You can visualize it as this area, whereas this is still, even though we worked with it, like kind of a fuzzy thing, like what is this really doing, and what is the derivative really telling us? And I think what makes it even worse is it's it's almost like uh, you're just manipulating this thing, right? You're just plugging these parts in and putting this other part over here, and then you write that down as your answer, right? And you get it right or or um, not. So so I think um, I like to show at least a little bit of an understanding of how they are connected. Um, so let's look at this function. Um, so let's try and figure out what this function actually is. So what we're really doing here is we are kind of doing what we did in the group work, sort of, um, in that I'm trying to find an actual expression for this accumulation function. Right? That was the a to x, b x that you calculated using geometry. But now that we know the fundamental theorem part 2, I can find this expression using antiderivatives. That's what the fundamental theorem part 2 says for us. The antiderivative of this is t cubed over 3 plus 3t. And uh, maybe let's, you know, I put a there. Let's just go from 1 to x. I mean, a is, <coughs> makes it a little less um, concrete. So g of x go from 1 to x. Whatever x is, I would just do this, which is x cubed over 3 plus 3x 
minus one third plus three. X cubed over three plus three X minus uh, eight thirds. So what this is, is my accumulation function. So if you want to find the area from 1 to 2, you can just put in 2 here. Right? If you want to find the area from 1 to 10, you can just put in 10 here. Right? This is like our capital A of X or capital B of X. So what is the derivative of that function? D squared plus 3. So well, yeah, at, at x, right? So this is our function, right? You can take the derivative of that. The threes cancel. And I get x squared plus 3 right, minus 0, which is not a surprise. That's what the fundamental theorem of part calculus of calculus part 1 tells us, right? Is that I didn't need to do this intermediate step that the derivative of this is the x squared plus 3. But two things I kind of want to mention by doing it this way is that, first of all, notice the constant part here doesn't matter, right? Whether I started at 2 or negative 10 or whatever, whatever that number is is going to make some different number here, right? But when I take its derivative, that constant part is always going to go to 0. So that's why when we write the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, it always feels like, well, a to x, like, doesn't that matter? It doesn't matter for the derivative. Okay, so as long as that's a constant, that part is always um, going to go to zero when I look at its derivative. And the second thing to understand is that um, I could do that one that way because I knew the antiderivative of t squared plus 3. If I give you the problem here, e to the t squared dt, it turns out that there is no antiderivative of e to the t squared, at least not using elementary functions, like the functions that we know. You, you can't come up with an antiderivative. It seems like an innocent little function, right? Like e to the t squared, no big deal. But it, it doesn't have a function in our standard range of functions whose derivative is e to the t squared. I can't go and find an antiderivative and then take its derivative and get back the original. But that doesn't stop the fundamental theorem part one for telling about what the derivative is. So even though I'm not able to find um, an explicit form for g of x, I can still tell you what the derivative is going to be. No problem. So the two fundamental theorems are related, right? I can connect them here by showing that if I know the antiderivative, and then take the derivative, I do get back what I started. Right? That's, that's um, what really both part one and part two are saying. They're actually saying the same thing. They're just, um, you sort of apply them in different ways. So um, the only, well, like I said, there's two reasons I show this. One is because I want you to see kind of how that constant ends up not mattering. And then also I want you to get this sense of, of really the whole theorem base is on this accumulation function. So I think of that as a function. It's really just telling us that that's a derivative, the, the, the derivative of that function. A lot of the problems that you will see will be um, part one and part two questions, right? They, are, they should be easy for you to tell apart. If you just think about them, right? One is the derivatives, one is definite <coughs> integrals. To find the definite integrals, the real key is just finding the antiderivatives, right? So 
you do have to, I guess my final word of warning is you, you do have to keep track of your layers here, right? Because derivatives and derivatives and antiderivatives, right, and where you're heading. So, you know, don't forget that this expression is really like an antiderivative. It's a definite integral, right? It's really telling us some sense antiderivatives. Um, so we want to go up, right, when we see that symbol. Okay. I'll let you, I'll let you go. It's a, a big day. Process a little bit. Um, so, um, and again, I think doing this work will help you for the quiz as well, because you'll be doing some basic antiderivatives, <coughs> which is a lot of... Um, Well, 
on you did it you good hmm? what's speaking did yeah did? i mean well we want to make sure we're connecting it to calculus right yeah I so i think and i'm gonna be wrong on friday until monday so you know and i didn't have and i don't even have my rough draft yet i'm looking at it Rates. Oh my god, what are you doing your job? I, I mean, probably trickle down the Maybe. Hmm. Um, well, good luck with that. You, um, you know, I think one option is to get to do it first. That's what you have no time to for. Email me right. and you might know what you have discovered or run into, and you could kind of look that over and kind of do a little. You know, so that I, I mean, I said that we haven't had a quick in a while because we're so far behind. Guide you in so the direction uh, that, that you recommend we have the material down by today. Manageable. Really? So, yeah. And apply it to the conference. <laughs> so I think I don't have it down. No, I don't need it. <laughs> right. But I, I was still struggling to remember we like make it happen. The 30 degrees and 60 degrees on the, uh, on the circle. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I know there's. I try not to do it to make sure that I like all the numbers I try to do on my own. Space, so I don't know. And I check it using the answer or whatever. And every single time I did that, yeah, I'd get like, so if you, like you tangent you one or something, or like you use the circle to find something, whatever cosine and sine was, and then put it on top of each other to find the actual answer. I get like, yeah, square root of two over two, and then I look at the answer and put like, um, like. Square root of the negative square root of three, and I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> well, yeah. First yeah, yeah, rule of like yeah. a recursive sequence. Too. So yeah, no, I don't generate. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So, so I mean, I'll be done the quiz. So, so I think that graph is like hard. That the inverse of the functions um, like cohost, you can't. But I think we need to expand on why and so. what calculus. I have calculus. signed in the post that. Yeah, I'm like, I'm so and that's good. I'm not. Totally. That should be another passive list. Hopefully. So, I think Although, I whenever I draw my graphs, the scale is way off. So, it's like either the points, points are right, but it's like a couple links. Right. 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 And I can look under those. The points are right. Like that. So, I can go in that direction. Is that? Yeah. Okay. So, and, and let's keep the move on. We're going to get rid of this for the rest of the week. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'll look for something from you maybe later today. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I saw head sounds good. Like I kept doing signs I'm with the X and that no, I have no idea. So same same thing applies. I mean, do yeah. some research, find something that you think is interesting. High school for like two years. You can send me. Yeah. That's fine. Uh, I didn't just score high enough to do this. Can this work somehow? Back in place or whatever. I'm a PSO student. Yeah. Okay. So I got placed in this one instead of calculus one. And then like. I got like A's in high school. Then I'm just like doing terrible. And I'm like, what? Yeah. I, I fell for the IB scam in high school. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were all in the middle school and were like, yeah, I think you can earn uh, college credits. Yeah, I was like, they they, uh, they wanted me to do AP, and I was like, nah, yeah. I'm not going to do AP, I'm just going to do PSEO. I mean, at least AP, a lot of schools will accept those credits. Right. Nobody takes AP credits. I know. Even if you pat or get a really good score on the test. That's, that's the reason. So I go to Armstrong, technically. Do you know what that is? No. No. Okay. Well, it's a, it's a, do you know where like New Hope is? Yeah. New Hope and Crystal. It's, it's like kind of by there. It's actually technically in Plymouth. Um, and the, like the, the other school I could have went to is Cooper and Cooper does IB. And like one of the big reasons I didn't go to Cooper was because, um, because Armstrong had the AP system and then I didn't even use it. So they, so it didn't really matter. I really only went to Armstrong because my friends went there. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Well, that's a good enough reason. Yeah, right. We have class today, right? <laughs> um, I think so. How is it? Oh, because it's only five minutes after. That's why. Oh. What have you been doing on the finals? Are you that guy that gets 100% in the finals? No. no. Absolutely like, not. No. I'm wondering, are you the one who gets 100% of the final? No. No. Who's the kid? I swear he's just putting up numbers up there, dude. I'm getting 60s and I'm like, somebody's getting the hundreds. Probably this guy. No, he he comes in, like, already knows everything. Yeah, he's really smart, but he takes way too much time on him. So he, like, the last one, he got one point off, but he didn't finish the last, he didn't do anything on the last two pages. So he got a 79. Mm. 
he did 80 probably like he did 80 points worth and he got a 79 mm -hmm. and then i was like but he just, if you would have went faster he probably would have got like a 90 or something i didn't know how to do that i work. think it's i think it's the girl that wears green that sits up there I yeah that, that's all i think but i'm like i swear he's just writing random numbers kind of make us feel bad <laughs> maybe he just hates the song. Like, I do so bad in this class, and I don't get it, because usually, like, math is my strong suit, and Thanks. I'm doing super bad at this. And then, like, English, I've always sucked at, and I have an 87% in a speech class, and that's because, like, all my homework assignments, I've gotten, like, half credit or, like, uh, 8 out of 10, it's because I don't do them fully or I do them late. And I have, like, an 87.5%, and then my English grade, I have, like, a 92, and I suck at writing. <laughs> and I, I'm like, this is supposed to be the other way around. <laughs> Literally. I like, didn't know how to do any of the homework. Like, cosecant and secant and tangent graphs makes me want to die. Bro, I, I just write random I like, literally I just, like, random shapes. <laughs> didn't I just guess? I just wrote, like, squiggles on a graph and, like, was like, that's it. Dude, that's this what is the section like. that I got an A in my math class for, for B's, like, the, uh, in high school. And this was the one section that I failed, was the, uh, the only section that I didn't do good on was the um, sine and cosine functions. The yeah, sine and cosine graphs, yeah. and tangent graphs. I don't even know how you get the points for a tangent graph. I forgot. I looked at the homework, didn't understand it, still don't understand it. Uh, at least I'm not the one girl that sits over there that always asks the wrong question and answers the wrong one. <laughs> like she's never gotten anything right. I don't think, like ever. Dude, I had like. Every time he calls on me, I forget it. And some people said the right answer. I'm like, oh, that's what I was oh, thinking. Yeah. I was like, I was thinking that. I just thought that was just something stupid to say, but I didn't say it. I was like, uh, I don't know. Either. And then the people that are too confident, as such, they say it, and then they're totally, completely wrong. And it's like, oh my god, no one knows what I can do. I feel bad. I don't. <laughs> I moved because she asked me to stop swearing, and I was like, that's not gonna happen. Oh. Okay, really? She's like, I'm feeling comfortable with you swearing. I was like, well, that sucks. <laughs> She's uncomfortable. Because she comes from a church school, I guess. So I was I like, don't, well, I don't care. We now you're in community college, so right. deal with it. <laughs> I was like, this won't be the only time you're going to hear someone stop swearing. I feel bad for people out of that shell, too. But my parents don't be real. Like, like, I, I was doing. My dad just says I'm a sailor. <laughs> He's like, are you kidding me, Ali? My, my parents, because I play video games, and my parents were like, you can't you can't swear at all. Like, let me swear on my video games for my parents to And then now I just swear on my want. Like, I don't give a fuck. I just use it as like a gateway. <laughs> That's the only thing my mom like ever sheltered me on was swearing, because she hated it. She hated it so much. Yeah, my dad would always make fun of me. After I turned 18, he was not here. He, well, he does care, but he was not for me.